Well, hi, everyone, and welcome again to the Musical Inner Tube. I'm Don Rooney. And I'm John Tim Payne. You know, Don's had quite a career in radio and television, where he's been an on-air personality, a news anchor, and even a TV weatherman. And John has been a college professor. He's written several books, and he's been an editor and features writer at the Philadelphia Inquirer newspaper. We first teamed up for a radio show in college. On one show, we introduced a soothing musical interlude. But we stumbled, and it came out musical inner tube. And that became the name for this podcast, where we talk with interesting people about their interesting lives, difference makers who've really made a difference. Today at the Musical Inner Tube, we have Nathan Gorenstein, and I knew Nathan for many years at the Philadelphia Inquirer, uh, where he reported on local news and was a member of the editorial board with me for a little bit, if you remember those days, Nathan. I and do. Thank you for recalling. You bet. And today he's here with us to talk about his new book, The Guns of John Moses Browning. Welcome, Nathan, to the Musical Inner Tube. Thanks very much for having me on. I guess one of the first things that's surprising to me, especially after reading your book, is that it's been a long time since there's been a knockdown, drag out uh, biography of Browning. And I'd like you to talk about that. Why has no one written about it uh, this way until now? It, well, there was the, the only existing uh, uh, book that, that uh, had ambitions towards being a biography was one published in the 1950s by his son, which was partly fictionalized in terms of it was written as dialogue, which was fictional dialogue. The factual events were correct, but the language was, was fictionalized. I think the reason that no one had ever done a serious history of the man was because of the subject matter, uh, firearms. You know, the folks who typically do, who almost always do serious history are folks connected to the world, the academic world. And the academic world, understandably, you know, firearms are controversial things and they have the bad sides. Um, are, uh, it's politically incorrect. There's a woman who's a firearms historian who tells the story of when she was in grad school, they wouldn't let her write a thesis on firearms. So it just wasn't a way, a subject matter to tackle if you wanted to get ahead. Another reason Browning uh, is relatively unknown in America, particularly in the academic world, uh, outside of the gun world, is because he had no public presence in American culture until very late in his life. He died in 1926, and the public didn't really become aware of him until 1918 when we entered 1917, when we entered World War One, and the army had to buy machine guns and and uh, to arm it, uh, its troops, and it had no machine guns because it wasn't a weapon in use back then in America. And all the guns they purchased, automatic rifles, tripod-mounted machine guns, came from Browning, and that suddenly made him famous. But what Americans, most Americans, didn't know was that many other firearms they had produced they had purchased from major makers like Winchester, uh, Colt, uh, Savage, Remington, were all firearms that Browning had designed and sold to those companies to manufacture under the company's own names. And even now, that's largely not known in America. So many of the famous lever action rifles, the famous shotguns in America, were actually in American history that, that people use for hunting, for skeet shooting, for target shooting, or, and handguns for that matter, were designed by Browning. Browning is the man who designed the modern slide action pistol. So virtually every sidearm, pistol, handgun in, a, in the world today is based on Browning's work. Uh, now, Nathan, in, in reading your book, mm -hmm. um, his background was uh, growing up in a Mormon community in Ogden, Utah, uh, back in the late 1800s. And he sort of uh, came by gun making naturally. His, his father was in the business uh, before him. Is that right? Yeah. Um, Browning was born in 1855 into a uh, polygamous family in Ogden, Utah, which at that time was a completely isolated Western settlement. There was no railroad for 10 or 15 years. And he, uh, his father was a gunsmith and blacksmith in this town of, I think when Browning was a teenager, it had all of 10,000 people in it. Um, and as kids did back then, you went to work at an early age in the, in the, in the, in the family business, which was gunsmithing and blacksmithing. So Browning grew up, uh, uh, in a family where metalwork was second nature. 
and he gravitated towards the mechanisms of guns. You know, one of the, the, the secrets of guns and one of the reasons for their popularity is that guns are actually fun and um, to shoot. Uh, and it's an explosion, this fire, this kick, you get to have a little machine working in your own hands. Uh, and, and Browning ex- found that he had a natural skill that um, made th- fixing guns and then inventing guns uh, easier for him uh, than other people. Browning could think in three dimensions. He could mechan- manipulate three-dimensional objects in his mind, uh, which is a pretty rare skill. And that was the fundamental basis of his ability to imagine a variety of firearms. But going back to, um, to Utah, he, um, he uh, uh, invented his first firearm in 1879 when he was in his early 20s. And it was a single action rifle that adopted a lot of other mechanisms from other firearms, but he assembled them all together into one very small compact unit which came to the attention of the, one of the famous American fire, uh, firearms makers, Winchester. Winchester had been trying to develop a, a similar gun on their own and had failed, despite having access to all the sort of major gun smithing ability in the east coast of the states, which was the industrial center of the nation back then. So they purchased Browning's gun, and that got him out of the, uh, the, the, the smithing business and into the inventing business. You know, when uh, I was reading this book, uh, it's interesting you say that he was not a huge public figure until uh, World War I, but in the way that he goes about inventing uh, and also just the fecundity of his imagination and how, uh, you know, and also that he invents a lot of things, uh, <laughs> it just, he reminds me more of an Edison almost in his ability, you know, this sort of fulminating ability of his imagination to see how to make things that others hadn't seen. As you say, he could adapt existing mechanisms and improve them, and he can also originate mechanisms. But he seems to be on that model of an American inventor who who simply invents a lot and a lot of different things, sort of a pioneer almost. He is. For, for the listeners, let me just add, uh, jump ahead historically. Browning is essentially the reason why we won World War II. That's a, that's a big statement. But every machine gun, every automatic weapon American troops, sailors, airmen used in World War II was a Browning design. Uh, so um, when you think about that, all those air battles, all, those, all that combat on land, all those boats at sea, we're all using... Uh, automatic rifles and machine guns that he made. Even the Brits in the Battle of Britain attribute the victory in part to his machine guns. So that, that's a hugely important historic figure. When Incredible. You one guy did all this stuff. So that's that's why you're hearing about him. Now, it's one of the main reasons why I wrote the book. Let me go back to what John said, which is, yeah, he did have, he unlike every other firearms inventor in world history, for that matter, Browning was the only one who had the breadth of imagination to design everything from tiny little pocket pistols that you could literally slip into a watch jacket in your vest to five foot long aerial machine guns that armed American fighters and bombers <clears throat> in World War II. He invented shotguns, he invented hunting rifles, he invented semi automatic pistols, and, and his inventions in all those areas were seminal and laid the foundation for many modern firearms. There are, there are a few guns in the world today that anyone can pick up and not trace something back to something Browning invented. Even the Kalashnikov, maybe the most famous uh, name in guns these days, it, there were mechanisms on that, particularly the safety, which are exact copies of things Browning had invented decades earlier. Um, Shotguns these days, most American shotguns have one or another idea that was traced back to Browning. And as I said, um, every pistol in the world today virtually is based on his work. Um, That's just a massive, I want to sit with that for just a moment. It means that Browning is, is, is one of the most important designers and inventors really in the contemporary world, not just the world of the world wars, but you know, we're, we're getting on to be 60, 70 years past that. And he's still very much uh, in the middle of every war being fought. uh, And, uh, and I suppose uh, every, uh, 
every firearm user's life. Uh, it's it's an amazing thing to think about the impact of one guy and all over the place. Yeah, Browning's um, the the, the uh, automatic weapon used in aircraft in World War II was still used by American uh, armed forces and about seventy or eighty other armed forces around the world today. Because every attempt to replace it has failed. It's the 50 caliber machine gun. It is sort of the heavy machine gun and that's Amer- that Americans still use it. Every, every, every mil- Western military in the world uses it. And that's pretty astounding when you think about a, mecha- a mechanical invention whose origins date to 1900. Is, it remains irreplaceable in, 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 in a military arsenal. And his, again, like I said, his, his handguns, which date to about 1906, are also the handguns that remain in in wide use today. Um, So it takes a certain genius to do that, and and it has a huge impact on history. As I I note in the book, guns occupy a sort of a moral spectrum of good to evil. (laughs) they, They really do. A gun can take a life or save a life, and it can do it with a single bullet in a single instant. So while understandably, people would like to ban guns. That, that's not going to happen. So we should understand the world that guns have made. And if you want to understand how we got here, the guy who brought us here in large part is John Browning. And and I think this unpleasant aspect of guns, which tends to dominate, is one of the reasons why people have tended to ignore him. Because when you're writing about guns, it's inevitable that you're writing about um, war and crime uh, along with hunting and target shooting. Uh, and, uh, I think it's made him a, uh, not, not helped his popularity in, in the, and again, I speak of this as a, as a, as a centrist, centrist Democrat myself, but, but as not helped his popularity in uh, the American historical industry, so to speak. Yeah. I, I wanted to talk about that too, and, and go back to something you had said earlier and something John had said. He, he was as prolific as Edison in his ability to invent and then actually see those inventions uh, put together materially. Uh, do you think if he had been born somewhere other than Ogden, Utah in the 1850s, that he would have concentrated on something other than firearms? He would, yeah, I think if he had had the opportunity uh, to to apply his his special skills, this ability to think in three dimensions, let me explain that a bit more. If you think of a Rubik's cube, it has what uh, six sides and forty or fifty different little colored blocks, and you have to turn it in your hands. Well, Browning's the kind of guy who could have manipulated a couple of those at the same time in his head. And that's what allowed him to come up with his envision his inventions. He never used blueprints. He didn't have working drawings. He would build a prototype that looks like the final weapon that worked and sent it off to the factories, and they would reverse engineer them and then make the guns. Uh, his All the machining work was done by himself and one of his brothers in their shop in Utah. Um, so, And what made that possible, what made his development of his firearms possible were uh, concomitant developments in uh, chemicals, uh, metallurgy, and machining, which allowed which which allowed for things like the the Wright brothers' um, um, light internal combustion engine that allowed the airplane to fly. That was a product of the same industrial and chemical advances. Browning applied them to firearms. So, had he been in another place, maybe in uh, in, in Ohio with the Wright brothers. He, I think he would have done that, yeah. And he would have succeeded because, again, he had a skill uh, which, which had he found another output for it, would have allowed him to succeed in other mechanical uh, ventures. It's interesting, uh, and, you know, this theme that we're striking here today uh, about um, the, the changing political place of guns in American life um, is – and, and that has something to do with the reputation or lack of it uh, of, of uh, John Moses Browning. Um, I mean, there was a time when uh, just about everybody in the country pretty much had to have guns. Uh, most people did not live in cities. And so guns were part of daily life. They still are for many, many Americans. Uh, but as life has changed and the problems of the cities have become associated with gun violence, 
and and again we have that phrase gun violence which uh, which can't be very old you know um, mm -hmm. you know used to you you know what i mean it's it's a, and as a as a long time journalist you know what i'm talking about it's a yeah, it's yeah. a phrase that's been invented to describe a particular kind of social evil right this isn't just people hitting each other in the street or stabbing each other these are people using a particular machine to kill you know so that has of course now become a talking point on both sides of the political spectrum, as you've said. And of course, now it's uh, to the point, uh, and I just think this is so fascinating, uh, where uh, if you are an academic, you wouldn't, you'd rather pick some other topic to try <laughs> if you were just starting out as a historian rather than writing about these things. It, 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 it's the politics makes one uneasy, uh, you know, and, and the difficulty of finding, I suppose, of finding other people who would uh, be your, uh, your dissertation advisor or who would publish it. There's all these odd things that come in the, uh, the train of this. Yeah. I mean, it's, the, the, another factor that I, I wonder whether goes into it is, is the, um, the distancing of uh, the American, um, the educated Americans from hand work, from mechanical work. Um, Interesting. In order to understand what Browning did, you have to have an understanding of how, uh, machine, how machine tools work, how metal interacts, what a, you have to know what a cam is. You have to know uh, specialized, the specialized language of gunsmiths. You have to have an interest in figuring out how different things, how different mechanical things interact and what are the tolerances required. And the people who do that now are engineers, are, 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 are and not academics, not typically writers, not typically folks who go into history departments. So in order to understand how extraordinary his skill was, you have to understand what he did that made him extraordinary. And if you don't understand the mechanics of firearms, then it's hard to appreciate what he did. I mean, despite um, the ubiquitous nature in a nation of washing guns, it's actually pretty hard to invent a working firearm. You know, lots of people uh, throughout history have tried to do what Browning did, and most of them failed. It, he wasn't the only guy trying to invent a semi-automatic pistol. There were dozens of them, mostly in Europe, actually, but also in the States, who came up with various ideas, and some of them worked and some of them didn't. But only one has withstood the test of time, and that's Browning's, it's called a, a tilting barrel and locked breech design with the pistol slide. You see everyone slide back and forth in the movies. That's Browning's invention. Um, and as I said, his machine gun, his heavy machine gun, is no one's ever been, fig no one's figured out a, a way to replace it. And his uh, lever action rifles are still made, and his shotguns, while well, most, some of them are still made, actually. So he made many designs. Some of them are still manufactured, but many of them had a, a wide influence on other designers. So it's really hard what he did. And I think, um, I'm guessing many folks in America, given the distance we've gone from handwork, may not appreciate the, the um, imagination and mechanical skill it took. You were talking earlier about uh, how he wasn't well known until his products became uh, mass produced uh, for World War I, um, which leads me to the question of why didn't he set up his own shop uh, and make Browning guns? Why did he give all of his uh, inventions to Winchester and the other gun manufacturers? Yeah, good question. The root of that can be traced to his early career in guns. When he designed his first rifle, he had to figure out what to do with it. Don't forget, he's in Ogden, Utah, which is connected by a railroad then. But this is 1879, and the entire American industrial base is, is based on the East Coast. And Browning is this kid from Utah, and he was insecure, actually, about his abilities. So rather than try and... He didn't. He was. He was also proud and didn't want to try and go east to peddle his guns to these unknown people in the east. He set up a little manufacturing operation in in Ogden with his brothers because he came from a family with uh, three wives, since with a lot of brothers. And he found he didn't like it. He didn't want to spend his time running a factory. He wanted to invent things. So when the Winchester representative found his rifle took it back east and Winchester realized this solved their problem and they gave him, they paid him $8,000 for it, which was a tidy sum of money back then. Browning said, we're not going to make anything. I'm going to invent stuff. 
And he had already had a, a second firearm uh, that Winchester knew about that as was, it was became considered the best lever, as, lever action rifle ever invented up to that time. And Winchester purchased that for a huge amount of money. Um, and so he, he enjoyed, he was a private, quiet man. He, he never saw publicity, which is one of the reasons folks don't, don't know about him, don't generally don't know about him. And so he was quite content to, to work in Ogden, raise his family, go shooting with his friends, and invent these guns. That said, though, when he had an opportunity to enter the wider world, he jumped at it. And, and that happened because his influence is extraordinary in Europe, too, which most Americans have no idea about. But in the uh, 1890s, when he was working with Colt, there was an engineer employed by Colt, who was from Philadelphia, by the way. His name was Hart O. Berg. And Berg had been educated uh, in, in Belgium. And in Belgium, there was a big arms making industry, but he had come back to the States and gone to work with Colt. And he and Browning become friends. And Berg is apparently the only person from the gun business that Browning ever invited back to Ogden. I mean, Browning <laughs> separated his guns from his, the rest of his life. Uh, and why did he do that? Well, my, my theory is that Browning is a Mormon, and folks forget how widely disliked Mormon, the Mormon religion was in America in those days. And Berg was Jewish, who, and he, they were in sort of upper middle class Yankee Connecticut. Yes. And my guess is they probably bonded over their differences. So anyway, Berg goes back to Europe, and Browning invents his pistols, and Colt Browning invents three of them, actually. The three, the first three slide action pistols ever made. And they're all different. This is a witness to his genius. Most people struggle to come up with one gun that works, and Browning came up with three different versions. <laughs> and Colt wants to build the heavy-duty one because they want to sell it to the military. But Browning likes the small little one that's fun to shoot. And so but Colt doesn't want to build that. So uh, he and Berg are in touch, and Berg says, well, we'll build it. Because Berg, by this time, is working for a company in Belgium called, I'm going to butcher my French here, forgive me, Fabrique Nationale de Armes de Guerre, which is the national gun-making company in Belgium, which was literally founded by the Belgians to make rifles for their army. But the contract was done, and they had a factory with nothing to make in it. So Browning travels to Belgium in 1896, 97, and they see his gun, and... Uh, the Belgians say, we'll make this. And so they make his gun. And between, so that's coming out in 1899 and 1900. And between those years and the beginning of World War I in 1914, FN sells 1.25 million Browning handguns in Europe. And that's something like, it's hard to come up with an accurate number, but it's about one Browning handgun for every 400 people in Western Europe. <laughs> and, and it becomes a cultural phenomenon. And the Germans, and there's this, it becomes a problem because people became entranced. FN were great manufacturers, and they were making these little tiny, not tiny, but the size of your palm, handguns that were like these little machines in your hand, beautifully engineered, beautifully designed. And people snapped them up, and they didn't appreciate how dangerous they were. I mean, guns kill people. And so they'd use them as fun, and there were a, it became a problem. And we have records from Germany be, before World War I where the national government is trying to figure out what to do because, as, as one writer, German at that time, put it, we are becoming a, a rather a culture of the a country of the knife. We're becoming a country of the guns. Back in those days, an apprentice would get his job and go out and buy a fancy knife. And then by the time Browning came around, they were going out and buying a fancy Browning pistol and they were <laughs> using them. And this was a problem. Uh, yes. And, and that made, and Browning became so widely known in Europe that in French, a uh, pistol was called Le Browning. It Le became Browning. The, term, the generic term for a handgun. More with Nathan in a moment, but first, this soothing musical inner tube. <laughs> Nathan Gorenstein is an experienced, multi-talented journalist who worked at the Philadelphia Inquirer, where he reported on local news and was a member of the editorial board. Before that, he was at the Wilmington News Journal, 
where, among many other things, he reported on the very first presidential campaign of a guy named Joe Biden back in 1988. These days, Nathan has turned to nonfiction. He's the author of Tommy Gun Winter, which tells the story of a Boston mob in the 1930s that involved a couple of his own family members. And of course, his new book is The Guns of John Moses Browning, a biography of the prolific American creative genius and designer of firearms, millions of which are in use all over the world. Nathan's books are available on Amazon and anywhere else you get your books, especially your local independent bookstore. For more information on Nathan, be sure to visit his website, which is nathangorenstein.com. He also has author's pages at simonandschuster.com and amazon.com. And now back to the musical inner tube. Going back to what we were talking about mm-hmm. earlier, did Browning in your research ever come to any kind of, um, uh, I want to say a moral, uh, uh, decision about the fact, because when he started working on guns, as John said, everybody had guns and, and they were used primarily for hunting and for sustenance. And then eventually it, you know, it came into the point where world war one was there, guns were there to kill people. And did Browning have any opinion or any moral attitude toward that? I wish I knew the, the closest, the, the thing about Browning is that he left no left. Well, I'll get to his records in a moment. The most, the closest we can come to that is a statement put out by his brother, Matthew. He, Matthew and he were blood brothers. They were very close, and they communicated almost every day throughout their lives, either in person in Ogden or by letter, because in the second half of his life, Browning was spending about half every year in Belgium. Um, and, and when this issue came up during World War II, um, the only response we have is from Matt, who put out a statement saying that we're men of peace, uh, and we hope that when weapons become so deadly, people will stop using them to kill people. So we, uh, we're, we're arming our nation's military. We want to give our soldiers the best arms they can get. But the idea is, and this is my paraphrasing, is that weapons will become so deadly, people will stop. It will make warfare obsolete. And this was not, that was a common philosophic belief back then, a common cultural belief. There were, there were books written about this, that um, right. Right. warfare would become economically untenable because it, it would become so devastating that uh, the, the man who invented the first machine gun, Hiram Maxim, also said, believe, you know, this is going to become so deadly, no one's going to get into a war because it's going to kill too many people. And indeed, what we saw in World War I was a slaughter on the likes no one had ever seen before. So unfortunately, they misjudged human nature. Uh, but that's the closest we have. Browning did not keep a diary. Uh, as I said, he, he kept no work paper of works. There's, there's no blueprints, no work changes, no nothing. Uh, he, um, he did write letters uh, almost every day. And unfortunately, most of those letters were destroyed. Most, um, um, according to what family members have told me, that, his, that Matthew and John's sons, eldest sons, thought the letters were too, um, not irresponsible, too casual. They'd make jokes, they'd crack comments about people, and they didn't want their father's reputation to be sullied by whatever was in these letters. So I'm told that they burnt most of them. Um, after I wrote the book, I discovered that there are some letters up and held by Matthew, held by a family member, which I have not seen. There, there were many Browning family members, and most were cooperative with me, some not so much. Um, uh, are they but, spread um, all over the place? Oh, yeah, all mm-hmm. over the place. They're in England, they're in all over the West Coast, all over the mountain states. Lots that of in and of there. itself, uh, getting to them, must have been uh, quite a labor. Well, I was lucky. I, I, I'll tell you what happened. And it's one of the reasons the book is successful is because I had, I had access to the only existing family archives, which no one had ever seen. And they were in the basement of a burning family member's house, about 40 boxes of books, mostly, unfortunately, dating from the late 1890s on. And there were very few from the very few, very little paper from their, his early life. 
but I was in Utah at the Zabroning Firearms Museum there, which I recommend folks to go to in Ogden, Utah. And I walked in to see someone and, you know, to be candid, it was this Gorenstein guy from the East Coast wanting to do a book about Browning. They had never heard of me. Uh, and so I, my guess is he was like trying to figure out who I was. So we ended up in a conversation about firearms. And I had done my research and I knew all about firearms and I had gone shooting so we could talk about it. And when we get done, he says, well, let me hook you up with the Browning family. Okay. And so I, and it turned out that a very nice gentleman by the name of Bruce Browning, who then was around 90, was John Browning's uh, last living grandson. It was also uh, two granddaughters. One, was, uh, one of them was very helpful to me too. And so he had, or they had in their basements, uh, all these documents. And I got, they gave them to Weber State University, but I was given ac access to them before they were processed by the university, before they were accessioned, which is very rare and was very quite extraordinary on my part because I found lots of stuff that no one ever knew about. Uh, and, and I interviewed uh, uh, Bruce twice, two, over two mornings. Uh, he was, physically, he wasn't great. Mentally, he was fine. And it was very useful discussions with him about the family, about Browning, about firearms. And unfortunately, he passed away before the book came out, but not before I found uh, something that was really extraordinary and also helped elevate the book beyond what it might have been otherwise, which was, I mentioned that Browning had no paperwork. Uh, there was very, very few documents existed where we heard his voice, particularly his voice about what he did. But in the course of my reporting, I came across two um, um, patent depositions and two patent cases. Uh, and they have in them of two very lengthy depositions of Browning and his brothers and some other folks involved in his firearms. And for the first time, we hear Browning and his brothers talk about what they did and how they did it. And, and, and it was, it's, you know, it's the only source we have about what happened. And one of the things we learned, for example, is that all these wonderful firearm prototypes, there are dozens and dozens, dozens of them because Browning invented I'm going to say 100 firearms, and he made prototypes for almost all of them. And Winchester was stuck, you know, as an aside, Winchester kept buying Browning's guns because they didn't want him to sell them to the competitions. And the Browning brothers joked, this is something in the archives I found, they called it their raids on the, on the Winchester treasury because they knew they were essentially extorting <laughs> money from Winchester. <laughs> Browning would invent something else, and Winchester said, geez, now we got to buy this too. And so, it, it, really, I'm serious about this. There were dozens and dozens of firearms, beautifully made. And everyone always thought Browning made them. He didn't make them. His half brother Ed made them. What would happen is that Browning would stand over Ed and tell Ed what to do. And they they got to the point where they could almost ex they could communicate without talking. And and Ed probably deserves some of the credit for Browning's work because sure. when you work with someone and you exchange ideas. You know, you have a comment, and Ed was was a good machinist, and he invented some stuff himself. So I'm sure he said to Ronnie, you know, John, that's not going to work, or John, try this, and John would do that. Now, Ed was always careful to say in these depositions, and he never touched a Browning design when Browning wasn't in the office. And all the, all the work was, all the thinking was done by Browning, his older brother. But still, Ed had a, obviously a major role in, in, uh, in, in the work. Uh, yeah, right. If John is not well known, you can imagine, you know, Ed's reputation needs a little pumping up. Well, you know? Ed is, you know, the, Ed is, is lost. Ed is largely lost to history. I mean, yes. Because the family made um, the family publicity, which happened again in World War II, was largely done by Matt, who was a businessman. He was mayor of Ogden. He was on the school board in Ogden. He was the sort of money guy behind the business guy behind the Browning. Uh, fortune because, and it became a huge, they became very wealthy on Matt's business acumen. They take the money that Browning earned and invested in all sorts of things. I mean, I think this is one of the parts of your story, which is, is fascinating. I mean, we've talked about, you know, this, all of these brothers are products actually, I don't think I'm being too silly here of, of the frontier part of America that changes yes. obviously, but they invent all three of them together. They sort of invent a closely held 
um, corporation that that you know designs and and markets designs for guns, which revolutionize the world. And uh, it's it again that strikes me as a very American story. You know, uh, you have the guy from Connecticut, uh, you know, getting close to Browning, and and you can see, as you said, that uh, they were so different that they got along just great. <laughs> you know, but. Uh, it, it toward the end you have Browning uh, and his brothers uh, really being uh, an international business, uh, yeah. it, it, and you know it's it's uh, it's quite a story. Folks may not. I'll, I'll tell a couple of personalized story. One people about what the effect of his guns. Um, one people may know, and one they probably don't know. World War One was started with the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Well, the firearm used was Browning's was the uh, the second. Browning design produced by FN. It was called the FN 1910, and it is a beautiful piece of machinery. And the black hand, the 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 terrorists in, in uh, Yugoslavia who wanted to kill the Archduke, specifically selected that gun because it was the best one around, and it was. It was nothing. There was nothing else like it. So that gun, you know, um, Princip, um, uh, is standing on a street corner, and and the Archduke's car literally takes a wrong turn and they thought they had failed in their attempt to kill the archduke and suddenly princip's there with his gun and there's the archduke he raises it fires two shots kills the archduke and his wife and the next thing we have was world war one in 1918 though another browning pistol was used to almost kill vladimir lenin uh Lenin, there was a revolutionary woman whose name I'm not going to be able to pronounce, forgive me, who felt that Lenin was betraying the, um, was becoming an authoritarian and was betraying the revolution. And she got an early version of Browning's pistol and she pumped three shots at him. Two of them hit him. He was very ill. He spent months in the hospital and his, many of his biographers, some don't mention this, some say, don't mention the long-term health effects, but those who do saying it contributed to his death in 1924 because he never recovered from the wounds. And we know what happened in 1924, Stalin took over. So what would have happened had, you know, Lenin not been shot? Would he have lived longer? So it's, it's interesting that, that and, and when, you, when you have guns as ubiquitous as Browning's guns, they pop up everywhere. You know, little known fact is that when, we were getting close to World War II. Winchester wanted to make a light rifle. So we had the Browning automatic rifle from World War I, which was still used, the first sort of assault rifle in the American military. And then we had his light 30 caliber machine guns, his 1911 pistol, his 50 caliber machine guns. And this is the American arsenal in World War II. Um, except for the Garand rifle, these are the main firearms. And so Ed invents a light rifle um, and... Uh, gives it to Winchester, and Winchester tries the development, and ultimately they change it a lot, and, and, and it's, not, it's not what becomes the M1 carbine, but it's what gets Winchester working towards the M1 carbine. Artie Murphy, the most decorated um, soldier in World War II, um, and the M1 carbine was Artie Murphy's favorite weapon because it was light, and, and, uh, and uh, it was also traced back to the Brownings, though Murphy won his won one of his congressional medals, his congressional medal of honor using a Browning 50 caliber machine gun to uh, uh, hold off a German assault while cracking jokes. And this is a factual truth because he was on a telephone line back to the artillery spotter and people heard him saying these things. And it's, it's like, you know, if you ever see... I mean, on the side, Audie Murphy is a fascinating guy too, just because he comes the archetype for so many American war movies. So it's 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 so uh, interesting because you are uh, sort of drawing out uh, a person's influence in physical terms, right? The the impact that he has on our material culture, right? It, it's and I don't want to get too brainy about it. But really, uh, the only person, I mean, people like Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, and of course, Edison, we mentioned him before, uh, Tesla, these people are, are, you know, Browning's up there with them. There's no doubt about it. Maybe even past them in some ways, uh, you know, given. In terms of historic import. Yeah, yeah. 
right? Uh, I can't remember anybody assassinating somebody and starting a world war with a light bulb. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, well, so it, yeah. I mean, when we think about what what you know what fame is made of, uh, and uh, or what impact you know how you measure impact, that's certainly one of the ways. Um, Nathan, I think uh, we shouldn't walk away from this conversation before asking you about your life as a gun user. Uh, what guns do you own? Um, well, I, um, I I purchased a number of Browning civilian firearms, um, pistols, and uh, some rifles so I could learn how to use them. I took them apart, put them together. Uh, I keep them stored in a safe. Uh, uh, and so I purchased those, and I haven't really used them very much. Uh, I took them out to the range, fired, and and you know I wanted I wanted to understand what he did. Uh, yes. And and but in the course of doing all that, I became a competitive firearm shooter. So I I uh, I um, probably got intrigued by it in the same way many other people have. I've always worked with my hands. I uh, I do carpentry. I built a couple of small rowboats. Of of I built some furniture, and so working with the firearms was not strange to me. And I got, and it's a firearms competition, particularly the, is, are a great challenge. It's it's people tend to think you just point the thing and pull the trigger. Well, if you're obviously many people do that, but if you're competing in a in a in a in a competition with a firearm, it's very hard uh, to because you have to. Um, at least for myself, I think circularly because I write and I don't, it's not a linear process writing something, but competing in a firearm contest is very uh, linear. You have to do very certain, very specific things very quickly with a gun going off in your hand, which is very loud, I might add. Um, uh, and so it's a challenge and I guess I like challenges. Uh, and, to give yourself, and to give yourself some credit also, it, it, it requires intense concentration it does. and, and yeah. steadiness and it, it's physically draining. I know that's for sure. And uh, anybody who's watched the, uh, the Olympic uh, shooting contests uh, has seen all of these things at work. I mean, it's, it's quite a skill. Yeah. And, and it's, it's one that, you know, I got into it relatively late in life and I, it, compete against guys who are in their twenties and thirties and forties. Um, one of the oldest guys actually who do this. Um, and I'm, I'm a mediocre competitor cause I, I shoot something called U S practical shooting, which is essentially shooting and moving with a handgun. And I have a competitive handgun and, and I practice and, uh, I've gotten better, but I find the mental challenge, the most, uh, intriguing part. It, it really is, very hard for me to make my brain do what I have to do in order to compete effectively. And uh, I think it's, again, for years, make, you know, I have to make my brain work in a whole different way. And that's what the, that's the most interesting thing. Well, Nathan, again, uh, your shooting may be mediocre, but your writing is not. <laughs> that is a terrific book, and, and it's a terrific uh, volume about uh, a man who uh, is not known. His personal life is not known a lot, but uh, hopefully your book will uh, correct that and, and help people understand what this man did and, and how it changed the world. Thanks a lot for being okay. with us today. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to The Musical Inner Tube. You can get in touch with us by email. We're at musicalinnertube, all one word, at gmail.com. You can follow us on Twitter at MInnertube, capitalize the M and I. Our webpage is musicalinnertube, that's musical spelled with two A's, dot libsyn, that's spelled L-I-B-S-Y-N, dot com. The Innertube is available on Amazon Music, Facebook, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, SoundCloud, iHeartRadio Podcasts, and anywhere you get your podcasts. Like us, why don't you? And give us a good review on any of those platforms. And as always, thanks to virtual band Car Radio Dog for our theme music. Music.